I'm really honored to be here in Guatemala today and to share some of my work uh, with you. And I want to thank um, you know, Anna Ingrid, Axel, and the university to invite me to share this moment with you. Um, so we can begin this. Uh, so it's, I, you know, I call this lecture Imagination and Possibility. And um, I thought I'd start with this. Um, there's a reason it's called Imagination and Possibility, is um, this painting that I did a long time ago. It's sort of, um, you know, I call it Imagination Gone Wild. And it's, it's, the idea is that um, within the potential of this painting, there are so many possibilities for, um, sort of creativity and different directions that this could go. And um, imagine, you know, as architects and designers, we create everything in our imagination first, and then we sort of bring that into reality, into tangible constructs. Um, so imagination really, like, like architecture, any project, any design project, is an act of profound optimism, I think. And uh, there is this belief in the future and this sort of belief in the possibilities rather than limitations. And um, you know, I wanted to look at some of uh, the projects I'm going to present to you in, through this lens, through this lens of imagination and possibilities rather than limitations, because every project is going to have a lot of limitations, uh, site limitations, budget, uh, program. And how do we sort of uh, transcend all those limitations and then create a project which is in the realm of possibilities? Um, so this is um, you know, something I love, is for whom limitless imagination is possible, anything is possible. And it's, again, it's the idea of um, you know, being in the realm of possibility and letting our imagination kind of um, sort of release us from the imprisoned possibilities within it. So, um, oh, before I go to this, so what I'm going to be doing today um, is taking you actually on a personal journey. Um, uh, because a lot of the work I'm going to show you, it's part of a bigger journey. And um, I thought that before we do that, uh, it would be great to do like a very short meditation. And so I know it's probably different from all the other lectures you've done here, but just go with me here. And what I'm going to ask you to do is um, just close your eyes. And it's just going to be very short for two or three minutes. And I'm going to take you through this meditation. And that's going to set the stage for what we're going to be looking at today. So just um, close your eyes and give yourself a moment to just relax and gather your attention inwards and let go of all the clutter, all the distractions, all your to-do lists, all the stuff that's crowding your mind, just let go of that. Just breathe in radiant light in the form of inspiration and breathe out all this clutter in your mind. And just be present to the moment. Just focus on your breath and the radiant light, the inspiration that you're drawing into your heart center. Now with this more heart-centered and peaceful mind, I would like you to think of a space or a building, or any kind of space that you love. And just 
give yourself permission to inhabit that space. Maybe it's not a space you've been to, but it's a space in your imagination. Just inhabit that for a couple of moments. And then ask yourself, how do you feel in this space? Why do you love this space? And what kind of impact does this space have on your mind? How would you describe it? Again, give yourself permission to actually inhabit that space. Okay, now you can open your eyes. And I want you to hold on to that feeling because we're gonna be looking at uh, everything through that lens of experience. Um, so as I said, I was gonna take you on a personal journey and this is as personal as it gets. So this is where I grew up um, in Calcutta, India. And it's right um, in that street where I grew up. And while growing up, um, I saw this temple being built. It took 25 years for this temple to be built. And I was a little kid. And every day, I would see this temple uh, sort of being built and um, painstakingly all the details being added to it. And for me as a kid, this temple felt um, it's sort of like, you know, as you can see, everything else around it. This temple was the tallest of everything around and the grandest. And it had, it had a soul, whereas everything else to me as a child, it didn't quite have that soul. And it, it just, um, it, it sort of, it really impacted me while growing up, while I, I looked at it every day. And when I was, I remember when I was probably 10 years old, I, I said to myself, what it, would it be like to actually be able to design temples around the world? And that's, I think, where a lot of the architectural seeds uh, were planted way back then. And little did I know, I thought I would be building stuff like this all around the world, but I had to start to define like, how can we define a temple, really? And this is something that, um, you, you know, I have um, come to define it in these terms. And maybe you would agree with me and maybe not, but um, this is sort of the journey, is that a temple is an experience. A temple is a communion. A temple connects us to ourself, to others, and and to the place. Um, it connects us probably at a much deeper level than we think we know. A temple engages us and all our senses uh, in many different ways. A temple is inexplicable, is uh, unexplainable, actually. It is communicative. It is emotional. And a temple is a journey. And in a temple, we are actually present. And a temple is, it serves others. A temple is for others. And um, so the question is, can every project aspire to become a temple? And that's sort of the question and the lens through which we are going to be looking at the projects um, that I'm going to present to you. And this is a question I want you to also think about. Can every project aspire to become a temple in the terms that I have defined it in the previous slides? Um, and in, um, 
sort of this is one of my paintings when I came back from um, Italy, living in Italy, and the idea that you know in a in a ephemeral and digitized world, we are actually so distracted and so isolated and alone, and um, we actually inhabit virtual spaces more, um, and we are engaging virtual spaces more than we are engaging physical spaces. So can we create projects uh, and spaces that actually reconnect us, that actually allows us to engage in a different way with the space? And um, it's a, the project, if it can allow us to be more present to to our physical surroundings. And sort of that's the question. Can every project become a temple? So the first project we're going to be looking at is, um, it's called the Great Eastern Development Mumbai, which is, um, this is a project in, in the heart of Mumbai. And it's, it has a very interesting site. It's the site of these textile mills which were burned down uh, in Mumbai. And it's a large site, it's 8.6 acres of land. And the, it's right in the heart of Mumbai city, as you can see, in terms of the context. Um, and Mumbai, as you know, is uh, sort of booming at the moment. And um, so it's a very, very, uh, it's a site with a lot of promise for a very high-end development that the developer wanted a hotel and retail luxury development, which want, they wanted to become a destination space. So this is sort of the fabric of the site, which I thought was so interesting. And then there is this, this um, natural haven, this freshwater pond in the site that the developer wanted to get rid of. But we, I, you know, just as the design process, my studio, we started looking at sort of the history of the textile mills. and. It was amazing to find out that the textile mills was a big part of Mumbai history, and it converted pretty much um, a port city to an industrial city. And there were uh, probably hundreds of these textile mills all around the city, and only now uh, probably 58 remain, which are taken over by private developers who want to make um, who want to make these uh, high-end developments there. So really, the challenge was, is that how do we tell the story of this amazing history of the site so that it's not lost? Because it was such a big part of the Mumbai history. And it's sort of, how do we tell this narrative and weave this rich history into the promise of this urban, um, of this urban development? So the concept came from the spinning and the weaving, uh, and sort of the technique of that, and this idea of the warp and the weft. And these are some of the, um, the actual machines that are still in the site. And started looking at, really, the constraints in the site were so many. I mean, first, it had, uh, sorry, we had this phase one, phase two, and the site was a weird shape, and uh, we had um, a lot of setback requirements, and a lot of other challenges with, um, with in, in terms of uh, all the cotton mills and the, the textile mills stuff. So we, we looked at sort of what are the constraints and how do we then make it these opportunities that we could really start to, um, start to really design with keeping these opportunities in mind. And we looked at all the urban context and where the main views were so that the project starts addressing that. And uh, this is sort of the diagram for the preservation that of the history of the site, where we, we took some of the vestiges of the old walls of the textile mills, and it became part of the, the circulation. When you're driving up to the mills, it became part of that uh, progression. And we, we um, preserved the chimney stack, the freshwater pond, and the, some of the trees there. And this is the, the initial concepts in terms of the urban voids that we wanted to create, because we didn't just want to create a high-end destination space, but we wanted to give Mumbai also 
a green space that it lacks. Um, and this is the initial idea of this, spinning in the weaving of these different uh, programmatic volumes coming together and where the densities, um, the, the densities then start creating the densities of the program. And then taking these green and blue threads that start interweaving into the fabric of the project itself. Um, the, this is sort of our design process for the tower of the hotel, where we started with a very simple hotel tower, and then through vertical and horizontal sectioning and responding to the views of its urban context, uh, we started uh, developing this massing where we have um, sort of this green slit that goes through and creates these terraces in the sky for the hotel. Um, you know, maybe they became community spaces or even private, gar private terraces for the hotel rooms. This is, um, this is how we, um, the actual massing of all these different elements of the program. So it's rather than creating these separate buildings, separate from each other, uh, we created this, um, these volumes that start interweaving and then they start creating these, um, these public spaces where these intersections happen. And then the way these green and blue threads start interweaving into the overall project itself um, so that's sort of um, the, the kind of eye, eye view of the project where this is how you enter into the hotel. We ramped up the cars, so you enter at the fourth level. And then this is where we created a large plaza for the retail. And um, the, there is this, this water uh, body where it becomes a, a social gathering space like an amphitheater where cultural events happen and the clubhouse and all of these terraces they start to these are all the amenities of the hotel which um, and then these are the terraces in the sky so what this it's giving sort of um, Mumbai these green spaces that Mumbai lacks. There, if you go to the city, there are very little green spaces uh, in Mumbai. And this project is sort of transcending the limitations of, its, um, of the programmatic and the site uh, constraints and giving Mumbai this kind of a high line of, on the roof where they can enjoy views to the, the river and actually connect to nature. But also the, the actual this is the entry to the, to the retail space uh, where you enter the plaza. And it's, it's, there's this big space, where, which is a gathering space. And even the, the way we did the facade is this, these shading devices, which are reminiscent of, the, of the, the spinning and the weaving of the textile mills, of the history of the site itself. That's the plan, um, as you can see, that, that's the, this is where the knot happens, where the anchor store of the retail, and that's the tower for the hotel, and then the clubhouse and all of these amenities of the hotel surrounding that. And this is how we created, uh, with just within this project, it's 600,000 square feet of uh, retail, hotel, service apartments, um, cl clubhouse, and um, restaurants. But we created all these different um, public spaces and green spaces of uh, different levels of uh, privacies so that people can enjoy this, uh, so that it's more than just a destination space. It becomes a lot more than, you know, that actually it engages a lot more of their senses. This is the view looking from the plaza up to the retail, where the retail, rather than becoming a mall, it becomes more of this um, high street plaza. And that's the entry to the, the hotel. And this is, um, these are some of the old, the, the walls of the, of the cotton, the textile mills that we preserved, becomes part of this progression. And here we create this, um, 
this great amphitheater, which becomes a place for cultural events uh, happening here. That's the tower. And as you can see, the, the terraces sort of, uh, they, they, they dance up all the way up to the tower. And we did a lot of the sustainability analysis. So a lot of the, the building skin has been informed by very rigorous, um, very rigorous sort of uh, analyzing of the solar insulation. And then we took some of that information and plugged it into Grasshopper to come up with uh, this facade, but very, so that we can you know, limit the number of uh, unique panels of the facade to maybe 10, so that this, we, we could still meet the budget constraints of the program. And this is sort of how we work in terms of the the analog and the digital and the, the design process, the way it happens. Um, and for this project, all our consultants were in India and we were designing this uh, in New York City. And so the traffic consultant, the structural consultant, the local um, architect who did all the zoning stuff. So there, is this whole, there was this whole big um, team but we were able to design it through, um, obviously, through the use of technology. But it's amazing that this can, this can happen now where we're sitting in New York and designing projects all over the world um, in, in here. Uh, these are some of the master plan, key plans of the hotel. And as you can see, it's, um, yeah. So this project, um, you know, just because I know you all are students and just uh, we spent a lot of energy and time and, you know, on this project. But this project went on hold a couple of times because of um, there were some land arbitration issues and, you know, problem with the developers. So we sort of started and stopped many times. And that's sort of part of the challenge. I think when you're going to go out into the world, Maybe do your, you know, if you're going to have your own firm or work for anyone else. These are the realities of, uh, of these projects. And um, what I learned from it was actually learning to let go of the attachment and of the attachment to a certain result that, uh, you know, I really wanted this to get built. And maybe it, it might still happen um, soon because we're still, this project is still on hold. But in, in terms of just enjoying the process and being able to give a project, um, you know, looking at it in terms of transcending a lot of the limitations and giving Mumbai or the city a lot more to the people of an experience than what um, most of the other developments are doing at the moment um, in, in Mumbai. So. Um, the next project that I wanted to show you was um, actually, it's a meditation center. So this is when it was being constructed. Um, it's, a, it's a New York oasis, that's how they called it. And this is in Manhattan, in New York City, in the heart of New York City, in Chelsea. And it's a storefront, it's about 8,000 square feet, the whole meditation center. And this is where people come to find inner peace. And this is the, this was the actual space when we started, which is, um, it's, it's sort of this office space that was, um, that we were going to transform into a meditation center in the heart of New York City. And this is sort of um, the space where we've, um, we've created this meditation space, and then we've created these um, openings that then overlook into this atrium which brings in natural light so that when people are meditating, they, the experience of that is, um, is way more deep for them. Um, so this, and this is the entry space where there were existing columns where we created these, uh, this staggered um, sculptural shelving system for them to display a lot of their products. But this entry space, actually, you, they get like thousands of people um, during a week coming to this meditation center. And the, the flow is very quick. So in order, to, 
in, this is sort of uh, this project was on a very tight budget because it's a nonprofit center, and in terms of working collaboratively with the center in terms of uh, creating this this entry space, which actually attracts a lot of the people into because they don't know they look at the books and they look at the all these um, the, the things they're selling. And they, they want to know more about, uh, and they, they have no idea that there is this big space inside which sort of opens up into, uh, into this big atrium back there. Um, so this, this used to be just an outdoor space, uh, and we thought, like, wouldn't it be amazing to create this atrium where we could put, um, we put, we created this enclosed atrium and then it became this sort of, um, this space, this quiet space in the heart of Manhattan for people to enjoy. And um, it, it has, uh, it, it's connected to the meditation space inside. And the use of materials, again, and it, it's sort of very warm. Um, and we, we try to create a bit of a New York feel. So it's sort of a modern temple in New York City. And this is, um, sort of the client um, who are the teachers at this meditation center. We work collaboratively, and this was, actually this project was such a community effort um, that it all came together with, there were a lot of people involved in, in the design, and they did, a lot of people volunteered their time to, um, to help with the building of this uh, center. So it, you know, it can get as busy as this, uh, it, it sort of, the reason I thought I would show you some photographs of how the space is being used now is so that you can see how it's really the experience of the center, of you know, engaging in the center that makes, that really enriches the lives of the people in the, in the center. And um, you know, there, there's a lot of laughter, there's, um, there is a lot of singing and partying uh, within the space in just the different ways it's being lived, where there are these, um, they are meditating, and at the same time, for different times, there, there is a party going on, and how this, the center opens up and uh, sort of welcomes the rest of the city. And more parties happen, and this atrium space becomes like a little dinner space, or it has, um, it's, it has so many different uses where it, it, uh, it has lectures, um, it's even when, uh, that's me here, sleeping. Um, so it's sort of, it's so many different uses that, um, or it's just a quiet place for you to reflect. Uh, but it just touches people in so many different ways. Uh, thousands of people, it's sort of the inner sanctuary in, in Manhattan. And uh, that's sort of, you know, the emotional nature of this space and the life that takes place there. And that's me and, and sort of the, the, the kind of love that flows through this space. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an urban temple. Um, the next project uh, I wanted to show you was, um, it's a little different scale. It's, it's, um, Ficus, which is, um, so this client who is a, uh, they wanted to open this um, lifestyle store, a chain of lifestyle store in India and the Middle East. And they came to us and they wanted um, to do everything from branding to creating the stores um, in, in different parts of the, of, of the country. And so the first thing we did was, we did some of their branding, and ficus is a genus of a fig tree. And then we came up with this whole idea that, you know, they would brand themselves as, you know, we grow furniture, sort of that unique hand uh, quality to that. And then we took this fine living, this um, sort of tagline, and then created it into, it's fine living where it's, um, for their products, which would be used uh, for, it's mostly home products, but also taking a, a bit of a, a kind of, um, a, the living then became the living and the breathing of this, the green. And it's 
the idea of blurring boundaries between outside and inside and bringing the green into the, the homes, in, into the spaces. So this sort of uh, juxtaposition of the natural and the manufactured, the contemporary and timeless, that became the, the overall concepts. And this idea that we can just take very regular, everyday things like uh, the shell of the home, the openings, the furniture, the windows and the doors, and that became a concept to show, um, to show actually they became ways in which the display systems were designed. Uh, and when we created, um, so this was a completely um, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary actually, um, project where it was branding, interior design, um, some architecture, and um, uh, graphic design, uh, where we created custom motifs and custom wallpapers for the client, which would be used in all the stores. So we created this motif of the fig and the bird to go with this whole idea of ficus, which is the, the tree, and created these, um, these very minimal uh, wallpapers that would become backdrops for a lot of their products um, in the stores. The, the actual um, fig, and then we created the, these, the logo of Ficus is this, and then we created this tree out of that, which then became these, um, these uh, huge walls where it became, in the stores, it became um, sort of a branding element in there. And then the doors became a way to show the signage of, um, and then we used a lot of the text to sort of communicate with the end user. It's, it's sort of, how do we tell the brand narrative? How do we uh, sort of tell the story of the actual, um, of the Ficus brand itself that sets it apart from all these other different, it's competition. So then we did a prototype for the store. Um, and this was the prototype, a typical prototype for a 2,000 square feet store. And as you see, the entry is, um, is in the shape of a, a shell of a home that even a child can draw. And we created these, um, we used the moldings in a very modern way because a lot of the products, uh, a lot of the furniture and accessories, they have a lot of moldings. And then we framed this tree, which we call it the sculpture tree, where it became a place where they can um, showcase a lot of their signature products. Um, in the store. So this is how the tree um, becomes the focal point and then the, the cashier is made of doors. And then we created these, uh, this is where all the perimeter display would be in the store, which is sort of a large window and a door with the shelving. Um, and then as you see, the doors, they become um, dividing elements between different parts of the store where they would have um, accessories or soft furnishing, and they also became um, floating um, display, the uh, floating display where the door becomes where they can also display more of their items. And then the chairs uh, and the doors together, they create more of these floating displays. So the idea was that, um, that the interior would be very minimal, but yet it would have that bit of an aha moment where you would make that connection between uh, sort of this, this kind of uh, way of showcasing um, their products, but using a lot of the very regular things like chairs, doors, and windows that you see in, in a regular home. And uh, that's where we created this, uh, every cashier would have this, um, this green terrarium inside. The, and then we created this, um, this sort of uh, small uh, portal where you would come in and experience some of the products much more intimately. <laughs> and um, the, the design of this, in a way, had to be sort of like a kit of parts kind of a design because there were going to be many different stores where, it, where they can take this prototype and actually be able to um, 
take this prototype and it should work for many different layouts. So we designed it in a bit of a kit of parts system as an overall prototype itself. So that's the another view of that. And then, um, so this, the, our first project, so this is what was, uh, so the client says, let's test out this prototype uh, in, in this store, uh, which the client owned, but it was a totally different uh, brand at that time. And let's create our first prototype in this store. And this is actually in the heart of Colaba, which is one of the most, imp uh, one of the most uh, important retail centers in Mumbai. So this is what was before. And uh, this is what we then created, um, where it became this, um, it's, it's a very tight prototype because it's on two levels. And uh, it had to be really designed in a very detailed way, looking at the, the conditions. So that's where you enter, you see the, the sculptural tree. And this is where um, so there was an exist, uh, so basically there, there's, there is an existing stair here, which this, um, it sort of takes you up to the next second level. And um, that's the, um, we created the screen to hide. And then again, inventive ways to showcase a lot of their products and using a lot of the branding to sort of talk to the client and talk, tell the story of the brand um, to the people who are buying this. And, you know, we came up with a lot of the text uh, and the way it, the things um, sort of um, communicated with the people. So this is what it was um, uh, when we, this is what the space was before. And this is how it was transformed, uh, the first prototype. And that's the, um, so this project was again, it was more about telling the story of the, the actual brand itself uh, in many different ways. Um, uh, and using many different, uh, you know, using the graphic design, the, the, the sort of, um, the journey through the store itself. Uh, and now, um, this, it's, this project is, um, it's a custom designed and curated lifestyle. So, this is a tower in New York City where um, it's, uh, we got this project to design a penthouse for, for, the, for the owner. And um, what was really interesting about this, um, this site was that it had the most amazing view of Manhattan looking from here. And the, the client, um, so this project was more of interior design and styling. So I'm, I'm showing you a bit of a large range of projects uh, here, just to see in terms of how, um, how we work in different scales, especially as a small firm, how, how that actually, how these different scales, they, they sort of, uh, you have to be flexible to work in these different scales um, and still be able to have the bigger intention of giving this sort of, uh, it's really about the project, uh, this project it was for the owner. And um, it's really designing every single thing in the apartment for, for the owner, including the art, and uh, that was curated for the owner itself. So the idea was to, uh, the owner wanted something very um, glamorous and very loud, but we were able to convince the, the client to, to sort of let the, the main art be this amazing view of Manhattan and everything else sort of goes to support that. So um, this is the view of the living room. Uh, the, a lot of the furniture here that you see is, is being custom designed. The rug is custom designed uh, by us. Um, and um, that's the, the stair that goes up. Uh, and rather than, the, the owner loved um, antiques, so we thought like, why not celebrate these antique doors that we source from India and put them as a sculptural piece um, and really 
um, sort of celebrate that uh, rather than he wanted to put photos um, of his family and stuff, but this is something that he really appreciated. Um, and this is the view looking up, and then um, he had the, the model of the actual, um, of the actual um, building, and so it became another piece of art for the owner himself. And again, these are all custom designed lamps. Um, I'll just take you through, through this. The owner wanted um, sort of Asian accents, so it's done in very minimal ways uh, within the space, so that you know this becomes a real home for the owner, where where he he finds his sort of space of refuge there. This is a this is a a piece we worked with an artist. It's custom design with cracked resin, um, and all of these are custom design pieces for the owner. And this is sort of given, you know, we also placed the Buddha there to give him sort of um, that kind of peace of um, mind. Uh, that's up to the temple. Um, again, you know, this juxtaposition of the old and the new is, uh, it's sort of, it's a theme that runs in this uh, penthouse all the way through. Um, yeah, like um, that. Um, this next um, project was a mall um, that we designed, and it's called the Extra Mall, and that's the name we gave to the project, and it became about the extraordinary experience of the mall. And this is a competition that uh, we did, and um, this was one of the first competitions that uh, helped me actually start my practice. Uh, because I was on a vacation in India, and then I found out about this competition. And this is, um, it's, it's a new town right outside of uh, Calcutta. And they, they wanted, they had this competition of designing uh, a mall. But they wanted something um, for this new town, uh, for it to be something very different that, and, and also give, the people a different sort of experience there. So the idea was, um, this was a concept sketch. So that was the project that we created. The, the site was really tight. And this, this mall was uh, different from the other malls because it's a much more extroverted mall where the atrium is exposed to the outside and all the signage is exposed to the outside. And then we wrapped it with this continuous skin that we pulled, uh, you know, the apertures, uh, we created these apertures and the ruptures in order to show very specific views to the inside, um, to display, to that show very strategically some of the visual merchandising in the, in the store itself. So that's the atrium. This is what I'm saying, it's a very extroverted mall. And so there is this, um, people just, can't, the idea was people, People love hanging out in the malls, even though they don't want to buy anything. So this was it giving them this other social space where they, they can hang out. And uh, it had this sort of um, quality where it, it um, yeah, that it's sort of this space where they all gathered. And that's the movie. There, there are three movie theaters here. And um, we created these terraces here because the site itself was very tight, and we wanted to give uh, the people a little bit more of this indoor-outdoor spaces where they can hang out. Um, so that's this is a model I did when I was on vacation um, to uh, to sort of enter this competition, and uh, then um, these series of models that I did to sort of come up with. Um, the, the design, and again, to show, you know, we work, um, you know, it's always about the analog and the digital. We have to always keep going back and forth between, you know, the rhino models and the, the sort of um, uh, grasshopper stuff to, you know, really making things with hand and actually drawing and actually testing out a lot of these ideas of, of how they work. So, um, so we won this competition, uh, but, um, and we did all the drawings, and then the project just uh, fell through. And so this, this is again, you know, I think um, what I've learned 
over these past many years of being a younger architect was to, to just really enjoy the process and learning to let go of the actual result. And um, because we have no control over, over that. But in terms of creating a great project, which, um, which is where, you know, the, if that was the intention, that's where the, the happiness came from of doing this. Uh, th this project, um, it's a, it's a, actually, it's a, it's a vacation home that we did for uh, a client in India. And it's, you know, I call it that it's a villa on an, it's, a, it's an orchard. And the whole house, we, we did not want to kill even any, uh, there are trees everywhere, as you can see. We did not want to kill even a single tree. So the whole house is actually designed around the trees. So we call it the trees house. And as you can see, the, they are putting down the, and the, this is a tree that comes through the terrace. And um, it, so the, the, the house itself sort of embraces all the trees within its, uh, its architecture. So as, this is the dining space looking out of the tree where we created this uh, water body at the entrance. Um, and this is how when, um, I mean, it's, it's still, they're still finishing off the interiors. It's not fully completed. So I just got some quick pictures of that. But in terms of being connected to, to nature and the site, and this is how the tree comes up into the terrace. And that, um, you know, it's, uh, we've created, we've actually, uh, you go around the terrace and enjoy the tree while you're sitting in the terrace. So the whole house sort of is, um, it's always negotiating all these different uh, trees, but also sort of celebrating them in a way. So that's the, the big veranda. That's the water body that we created. This is, um, and then we created these like um, window overlooks where, uh, and uh, at many different levels, where you can enjoy a moment and just, you know, be where, when you're, because this is out in the country and uh, the clients live in Mumbai, which is sort of very, very busy. So this gives them this, that moment to just connect and relax. And, um, you know, then all, uh, this is the little girl. This is sort of, um, this is how they use uh, this space. Um, Again, it's, uh, it's, this is the, the tree is here. And this tree is what goes up to the second terrace. And this is how sort of um, the family engages with the space. And they have a lot of um, visitors come to engage in that. And this, again, this sort of thresholds, they keep shifting between the inside and the outside, how that keeps shifting. And, um, you know, from the, their uh, sunroom, there is always this sort of uh, views out to the to nature. So every time you're being connected to the, and these are, again, these windows, they kind of jut out to, to experience the actual trees themselves. Um, and we've created these windows because first they have a lot of guests, but also because, um, and that's the entry of the house where you, you see that uh, this sort of, um, the inside outside being blurred all the time. Um, quickly going through this, um, this is a project that I did when I was working at SOM. And again, you know, thinking about a huge project like this is five million square feet of office space. But we were able to convince the client, um, this is in Hyderabad in India, uh, five million square feet of office space, that. Um, you know, rather than creating these factory offices, which were 40 meters deep, we convinced the client that you can still get the efficiencies, even if we did these courtyards, um, and then created this amazing landscape uh, that, you know, where all these people who work these long hours, it, it's an IT office space, where they can actually relax and connect and, you know, be with the, with the nature within this development itself. So the whole concept actually came from this building as an extension of the landscape. 
and uh, that's it's part it's part of a larger uh, of a larger master plan. Um, and then we developed two buildings um, where again this idea of the the landscape, which was very hilly, how that on the ground level plane then actually becomes these buildings um, where uh, and it creates all these amazing spaces for people to enjoy within within this landscape itself, but still give them this th these amazing spaces which are filled with light in the offices. Um, as you can see, this these are some of the photos, and then we stepped these um, the floors in order to create this thirty percent reduction of. Um, and then in terms of um, really adapting the local pattern to create these uh, shading devices, which, um, which also added that layer of, um, you know, of the cultural specificities within the projects itself, and, um, and helped a lot with the sustainability. But then, the, so this project then became sort of this new way of working where um, they have more spaces which are drenched in light and um, with these amazing landscape uh, moments everywhere. This is a, it's a, it's a, in Moscow we were invited to do a, um, a, an exhibition pavilion and we thought that rather than just showing the projects um, on paper and then exhibiting it, why don't we just immerse the people in, in these projects? The, the pavilion was called Greenhouse. And what we did was we projected all the projects on the four walls and then created this bench with, where they could lie down or just have a moment to connect with the project. So because everything was in darkness most of the time, then we created these light um, pods where all the information about the projects were in there and all the text that they could uh, but the whole idea was giving the viewers an experience of immersion into the project itself, um, as you can see, in this architectural festival in Moscow. Um, and that's, um, and then finally, um, this was a project we did, I, did, I designed with SOM, um, where I worked uh, as a designer on the project, which is the, um, Qatar Petroleum, and this is where we also created a, a space of a mosque. Uh, and um, sort of, you know, again, coming back to the idea of that temple, and what does it mean to connect, uh, to actually create um, a project of a temple? So the idea is, can the question again is that, can every project aspire to be a temple? And I hope that through, through this journey that we've gone today, that I'm, you know, I think the big takeaway is that if we have the intention of uh, a temple or any other project being of service to others, then through the power of that intention and through the force of our imagination, we can have limitless possibilities of creating these kinds of projects um, at any scale and anywhere in the world. Um, and I think that's how I would like to end this talk. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sadika. Uh, we'll open up the floor for a couple of uh, questions. Uh, I'll start with the first one by um, asking you, uh, you know, being Already being a citizen from a specific country on your own country is, is, is already a difficult uh, challenge to open up your own firm and uh, mm -hmm. to get the clients to get start getting the project. So in your case, being you know from from, from India and then moving to New York um, and having this kind of international uh, education, mm -hmm. how what were the challenges that you were and still are facing in terms of of uh, getting uh, the projects to get your firm working? Yeah, that's a great question, Axel. And it's, um, I think it's, uh, it's always evolving. So the challenge is, I think with any office is, or any young practice is, is how do we get 
the projects uh, and how do we get new clients and how do we actually engage in the projects that we want to design. And um, there's been in terms of, um, and I think a part of it, that it goes to this idea of always looking at the different possibilities and actually not being afraid to try out all of those different possibilities because what I've learned is that there is not uh, any single answer or one single way of doing things. I mean, you know, there are many ways of doing or getting different projects and the idea, the whole idea is sort of, um, is sort of putting yourself out there and then just uh, it kind of sort of marketing yourself out there. And, um, and I guess a networking is a big part of that too in terms of um, being able to meet new people, network with, the, with new clients. And, but I, I think also is it being able to talk about your work um, in, a, in a specific way that um, that'll help you get the projects. Because I think if you are passionate, I think that comes through, um, through a lot of work. So the way I started was, um, was actually, um, I just started, uh, I said, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start my own company. So I, I made a list of uh, probably over 100 developers and I started with India and then I just started cold calling all of them. And uh, that's sort of how I started and just saying, give me 10 minutes of your time and I would love to talk to you and show some of my work. And that, just, you know, that act um, of being sort of just persevering and being out there sort of got me started. Um, and, you know, obviously there are competitions and all of that, but I think it's always about like, always looking at different opportunities um, and seeing how we can best uh, position ourselves there. Um, but okay, maybe this question we have talked about at some point, but I thought it would be good to bring it to the public. And it's just, um, how do you, how has your experience in working in an office like SOM, how did, did that train you for, for going to your own practice? And there are different scales, and there are very different ways of working. But how, how, how has one informed the other, and, and vice versa? Or uh, have you thought about just going back, or the advantages of one versus the other? Right, no, it's a great question. I think, um, I think when you're coming out of school, I think uh, the kind of experiences I got working in offices, especially of offices like SOM and some other larger firms, it was very helpful because um, I saw sort of what it takes to produce good architecture. And I saw like, what is the process? And um, I, I got really, it's the exposure. I think it's the, I think what we need as, um, you know, young people coming out of school is the exposure of being of the different kinds of projects. And I think at uh, the firms I work for, I get, got a lot of that exposure and the training to be able to think quickly and design quickly because in firms, everything is under deadlines and you have to be able to do things very quickly and actually design very quickly too. Where sometimes you don't get enough time to really, you know, um, like if you're, if you're trying to uh, sort of uh, develop a concept. You know, we as architects and designers, we want to develop a concept for like months if we could. But it's, it's sort of like, how do we do it quickly under major deadlines and under major, um, you know, project realities and budgets? Uh, so it was sort of, it was very, very helpful to see how the real world actually works. And, uh, and I think, uh, that sort of is the training that we need because after that, you know, the different scales of work, we can always, it's a different way of thinking, but the scales is something we can get, or, you know, you can teach yourself how to design in different scales. But overall, like being in good practices where you see how the design is being done, that's what is very valuable um, as, as, a young, as a young practitioner. So... I think that's what, and you know, I think it's uh, your question to whether I would go back or not. It's sort of, uh, yeah, I think it's very flexible. And I think that's this whole idea of the possibility is that, you know, you don't know what kind of opportunities that might come um, 
to you when and in which part of your career. So you just have to be open. Uh, you know, you can do your own practice, but if an op opportunity comes up with, to work with a firm for a certain project, that's also great. So it's sort of, and it's not fixed. It's always like moving one to the other. So I think uh, just being with a very sort of open and flexible frame of mind. But at the end of the day, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, what inspires me. And for me personally, it's the idea that, you know, at the end of the day, I am doing a service because, you know, I think 90% of our time we spend indoors or in buildings. So architecture and spaces, they affect us way more than what we even think they do. And I think that's, that was part of the meditation we did at the beginning, was just to understand like how much effect does a space have on our mind and how it can transform our lives even way beyond than we, we probably could know. Okay, thank you so much for listening.